I think uh, Euler and the Zone Anatomy Committee for inviting me again this year just to talk about the distal biceps tendon injuries. Uh, this uh, type of injuries are relatively uncommon, but in recent years uh, it, the diagnosis is really increasing. Also, the, the incidence of lesions in the general population is low. Our studies uh, show much higher values uh, to 9 cases per 100,000 inhabitants. This may be probably due to the diagnosis uh, and its uh, difficulty, especially in cases of uh, partial tears. Tendon ruptures are injuries that affect uh, almost exclusively men. There are only very sporadic cases in the world literature of uh, tendon ruptures in, in women. The data of dominance are also discrepant. In our uh, study, we had uh, very similar rates between dominant and non dominant arms. The mechanisms of injury is well known in form of a sharp extension of the elbow against an active flexion. The patient notices uh, almost always a clear snap and an immediate pain. We can use uh, several clinical tests that help diagnosis. However, the clinical diagnosis of a rupture is really difficult when most of the tendon remains inserted or if the Lasartus fibrosis is not broken. This happens in more than 55% of the injuries. In the anatomy, we have always considered only the distal biceps tendon. But should really consider more a distal biceps insertional complex that includes the bicipital or internal intramuscular aponeurosis, the external aponeurosis or lacerta fibrosis, and also the proper tendon and the paratendon covering the, the entire structure. In most individuals, the distal biceps tendon is made of two separate components that correspond to the long and short heads of the muscle. They are separated by a septum and this septum of endotendon is also wrapped by a single paratendon. On ultrasound these two components can be clearly identified as ovoid structures with different shapes. At the level of the myotendinous junction, the, the tendon corresponding to the long head is located lateral to the tendon that corresponds to the short head. Distally, the tendon of the long head attaches deeper and more proximal, while the short tendon is superficial and, and more distal. The tendon also rotates 90 degrees from the myotendinous junction to its distal attachment, with the tendon of the right arm rotating clockwise. This torsion explains the difficulty in distinguishing both components in the long axis. The lacerta fibrosis is also very variable. In some cases, with more tendinous components, while in other, with more paratendinous component. For longitudinal ultrasound examination, we recommend an ulnar oblique approach with the elbow in in, in extension and maximum in maximal supination, directing the transducer tangential to the forearms. This technique enables the evaluation of the fibral pattern of the, of the tendon. The careful orientation of the proof is really essential just to achieve and to avoid misinterpretation of anisotropy artifacts. The distal aspect of the tendon has a really fibrillar uniform pattern about 6 mm in thickness and slightly thickened distally, as we can see here in these images. <laughs>
On oxal planes, the examination has to be performed by moving the transducer proximal and distally using an anterior approach with the elbow also extended and fully fully supinated. The image reveals an ovoid structure from which the two components can be sometimes differentiated, especially when when they are pathologic, like in this case. The anisotropy requires a very dynamic examination, especially when one approach the distal insertion of the of the radius to tuber- the radius tuberosity because this is a very important place. Most of the ruptures are in this attachment. This is why we have to follow real in the short axis just to achieve the insertion of the tendon. Isolated or combined uh, ultrasound findings in tendon lesions are the following. The tendon enlargement with altered morphology, also the altered echo structure with an hypoechoic tendon, and also the peritendinous effusion or liquid inside the tendon. And in case of a tear, the absence of, of a component or all the tendon, also refraction artifacts owing to the loss of tension, the lacertus fibrosus and the paratenon hypertrophy, and also a dynamic dissociation between the radius and the tendon. We published in open access last year a classification describing the injuries to the distal biceps tendon. Therefore, we have divided our findings in two groups, the chronic and the acute injuries. In this second traumatic group, we found three different types of injuries. Type 1, corresponding to an excessive tendon elongation that, however, maintains the continuity of the tendon. Type 2 corresponding to partial tears and type 3 that corresponds to complete full thickness tears. Type 1 injuries are the less severe, the really the less severe form of injury. This is a tendon elongation just over the elastic capacity, capacity of the tendon. And the ultrasound shows an increased tendon thickness. We can see the thickness of the tendon is clearly enlarged in comparison with the the unaffected side, but without loss of continuity. We see the continuity and the attachment from the tendon to the radial tuberosity. We find in these cases an altered echostructure with intertendinous hypo echoic regions in a fusion and in and surrounding the tendon. We've subdivided type 1 into type 1a when the tendon changes can mostly be appreciated in one of the two components of the tendon while the other one has lower changes. Like this one, in this clip, in these images, we see an apoichoic fusiform swelling of a single component of the tendon, the short head in, in this present case, while we have an almost normal large head. Again, the enlargement of only one component of the tendon while the other one remains still physiologic. Another one with an affected one component of the tendon while the other one remains in place. In our classification, type 1b corresponds to elongation injuries that affect both tendon components. 
on ultrasound and uniform hypertrophy of the two portions of the tendon can be observed. It's really not possible in this case to differentiate clearly both components. So we can see in both clips and then arcs and then in the short axis and also in the large in the long axis. On this long axis, due to elongation, the large and hypoechoic tendon can be observed. And in both uh, planes, both the continuity of the tendon onto its insertion and the fusion surrounding the tendon can be clearly observed. We've classified as type 2A lesions partial thickness tears that do not affect the total width of the tendon. In this case, with intertendinous partial tears that do not affect clearly the insertion. See the holes inside the cleft inside the tendon, but the insertion remains in place. This is a, one of the forms of type 1. 2A lesions. But more often, in cases of 2A lesions, we see tears, tears affecting the insertion, but less than 50% of the entire insertion of the radial tuberosities. We can see here the cleft, the rupture at the insertion, but remaining more than 50% of the of the tendon. In other cases, with such types of, of tears. Less, lesions or injuries type 2B are ruptured that affect more than 50% of the of the insertion. So we can observe in this long axis remaining only one third of the insertion of the tendon to the radial tuberosity or this another case it clearly shows the big rupture of the tendon onto its insertion. We can see these other cases of type 2B lesions or ruptures affecting more than 50% of the of the injury of the width of the insertion. More cases. These cases the insertive the insertive width of the tendon is not uh, complete affected because some portion of the tendon yes they still remains inserted. This is another case in which most of the insertion is, is still detached. We can see the real correlation from this type of 2B lesion with the OP, op, op pictures, where we can see that only a very small part of the tendon just still remains in place. This is not a case of, of a, a rare type of, of, of rupture. In the short axis we can clearly see that one component of the tendon just disappears the loss of part of the tendon while the other part of the tendon remains in place yes moving to its insertion on the long axis we can see a proximal stump of part of the tendon while other part of the tendon 
yes it still remains this thumb and the other part of the of the tendon yes remains and maintain the continuity onto its insertion of a picture so clearly the lesion we can see the proximal retraction of the short head we have to really to open the interval between the lacertus fibrosus and the remaining long head just to see the stump of the short head component located between the lacertus fibrosus and the long head and due to an isolated complete tear of only the short head but the long head still remains in continuity onto its insertion. We have classified this type of complete retracted tears affecting only one component of the tendon as type 2C lesions. Another case of type 2C with a complete tear of only the short head, we see the stump and we see how one component of the tendon really disappears. And the damage the, the, the tendon the, the damaged tendon component appear retracted and irregular. We found at the ultrasound the retraction of the broken component and the absence of part of the tendon in the short axis. Complete tears with detachment of both tendon components from the radial tuberosity were classified as type 3 injuries. In these cases, we find isolated or in combination the following changes on the ultrasound. The absence of the distal tendon attachment with fluid, also the abrupt tapering aspect of the tendon, the, refract the refraction artifact due to the loss of tendon tension, and also a possible lacertus and paratendon hypertrophy. In some cases, the integrity of the paratendon and the lacertus fibrosus prevents retraction. We see here the stump and only one centimeter complete rupture with very small retraction. In this uh, case, we can see a retraction of, 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 of less than 1.5 centimeter. When the retraction is small, it's really difficult to differentiate complete from a partial rupture. It's really very important to perform a dynamic exploration just to access the binding between the tendon and the radial and the radius and the radial tuberosity. Another this is another case, also really not very often, in in which we we see a, a really abrupt tapering aspect of the tendon with a, a clearly retraction, but maintaining some some ecostructure, yes, attaching to the bone. In this case is really very important just to study the lacertus fibrosa. We see that the tapering and the hypertrophy, the clearly hypertrophy, hypertrophy of the lacertus fibrosus. We see the, the tendon retraction artifact, absence of tendon and hypertrophy of the tendon. This is these are type 3A lesions in which we can observe a complete tear with really the disinsertion of both portions of the tendon at a radial tuberosity, but with an integrity of the lacertus fibrosus. And this prevents really big retraction of the stump.
These are the OP pictures of the previous case. At surgery, the paratenon was clearly hypertrophic and has to be incised just to, to reveal the complete tear and the retraction of both tendon components. The muscle retraction was prevented exclusively by the hypertrophic by the hypertrophic lacertus and also the hypertrophic paratendon that really engulfs the tendon the both tendon stumps. The intact the intact lacertus as we can see, prevents the significant retraction and enlarged due to the increased tension, as to see here in comparison to a normal lacertus. This makes really very difficult to evaluate clinically the complete rupture of the biceps tendon. This is why we will have strong difficulties to recognize this rupture in the clinical exploration. The integrity of the external ponylosis and paratenon in this other case prevents further retraction of the tendon. An ultrasound can really assess the hypertrophy of the of the of the lacertus fibrosis, as we can see here in this case. We see the tapering, the disappearing of the tendon, but still remaining the lacertus in place and a really hypertrophic lacertus that prevents more retraction of the tendon. And this with another case in the short axis that clearly shows the, the amount of the retraction like in this case with a retraction of only four centimeters in a complete Tear. Complete tears that are associated with Lacertus fibrosus tears are the most retracted, generally over 8 cm. We classified this type of, of, of tears as type 3b ruptures. In ultrasound, the tendon has a serpentine appearance that also moves with really with, with palpation. In compression and also with contraction of the muscle with a clearly well demarcated stump. Let us see the possible implication of this classification in the therapeutic management of the bicep rupture. Ultrasound can provide an early diagnosis that uh, enables early surgery assessing the retraction of the tendon and allowing to plan the surgery incision. We consider you know, a clinical surgical treatment in type 3 lesions because of the decrease of the flexion force of the, of the elbow. And also in partial tears with affection of more than 50% of the insertion, like in this case. To remember that the distant insertion of the biceps brachii is composed of four structures the internal aponeurosis, the lacertus fibrosus, the proper tendon, and the paratenon. We have to suspect ruptures in men between 40 and 50 years with an acute pain following an abrupt extension against the flexed elbow. Complete ruptures with injury with injury of the lacertus fibrosus are associated with important retraction that facilitates the ultrasound diagnosis in the short axis. And also take care that complete ruptures with remaining lacertus fibrosus, partial tears and elongation are really more difficult to diagnose and requires both axis and the ultrasound examination. In conclusion, Ultrasound imaging is really very useful in diagnosis of distal biceps tendon injuries. Anatomic knowledge is essential in the evaluation of this type of injuries. Careful examination using a dynamic technique is essential just to avoid misinterpretation due to anisotropy. An 
Ultrasound enables the differentiation of complete from partial tears, which plays an important role in the decision making on whether or not to operate. It remains really very difficult to determine the size of a partial tear at the insertion or to differentiate elongations from partial tear. In complete tears, ultrasound can assess the extent of retraction of the tendinous stump. Some tips for the ultrasound examination. Use short axis to make ultrasound diagnosis in complete tears. Use longitudinal long axis in partial tears at the insertion. In our studies, ultrasound and MRI are equivalent for diagnostic purposes in type 2B or 3 lesions. Both techniques have similar difficulties to differentiate elongations from partial tears at the insertion. Early ultrasound diagnostic enables early surgery that improve the prognosis. Thank you very much for your attention.